Good morning, good morning. So this morning we have Dr. Hansen, our neuro-ophthalmology fellow, um, that's coming to talk to us uh, about the visual quality of life in migraine patients. Um, and she did her training at the University of Cincinnati um, and then joined us and has been here for, well, it'll be a year in July, I guess. So uh, if you'll welcome her and um, she'll have some time for questions. <coughs> All right, thanks for having me. Uh, this, uh, originally there was gonna be two presenters, but now it's just me. So I added this talk on, which is pretty brief, um, but I'm also gonna be presenting an interesting patient that we saw in clinic. Uh, so this is a project that we're doing in the neuro-ophthalmology department, looking at the visual quality of life in patients with migraine. So just as a quick update on the background, uh, as everybody knows, migraine is a neurovascular clinical syndrome uh, in which patients get recurrent episodes of head pain that do not serve any warning purpose. It's very common, globally at least 11% of the population, but in some populations it's up to 20%. As everybody knows, frequently patients get light, sound, and odor sensitivity, and up to 30% of patients get an aura. Uh, most patients are photophobic during an acute attack, uh, but there were two really important papers that showed that patients with migraine are actually more light sensitive than the average person in between the acute attacks. So the IIHTT looked at visual quality of life in patients with IIH, and they used two different questionnaires, the uh, NEIVFQ25, which is the National Eye Institute Visual Functioning Questionnaire, there's 25 questions, and the Neuroophthalmic Supplement to the NEIVFQ25. And interestingly, the scores were actually pretty similar to scores that patients had who had MS and optic neuritis, and they found that patients with worse visual acuities and worse pain symptoms also had worse visual quality of life. Not that surprising, but uh, one of the reviewers' questions and one of their biggest critiques were that we couldn't say how much of the decreased visual quality of life was related to migraine because there's a huge overlap of migraine and IIH. And essentially that answer just wasn't known, hadn't been looked at. So we decided to use four different questionnaires and the first two on the list look at the visual quality of life, and the second two look at the impact of headaches and the headache severity. And I'll just show you a screenshot of each one to give you an idea of what they're like. So this is from the NEI VFQ 25. As I said, there's 25 questions. They're all Likert scale questions, um, but they ask things like, how much trouble do you have driving because of your vision, and how much trouble do you have finding something on a crowded shelf? that sort of thing. And this is a screenshot from the Neuroophthalmic Supplement. It's 10 questions. Again, they're all Likert scale questions. Um, they ask things, questions about double vision and blurred vision and pain with eye movements and lid position, things like that. This is the migraine specific quality of life questionnaire. So all of the questions are asked relative to uh, how much migraine has affected them in the past four weeks. Um, and it asks things like, you know, how much have migraines interfered with your ability to do your daily work activities, stuff like that. And this is the HIT-6 questionnaire, six questions. Again, all Likert scale, designed to uh, see how much of an impact the headache has on their daily life. So we separated participants into three groups, those with chronic migraine, those with episodic migraine, and a control group. So our inclusion criteria were patients who had migraine headaches that fulfilled the ICHD third edition criteria, and if they had migraine headaches for at least 15 days out of the month, they were put into the chronic migraine subset, and we just did adults. So we excluded patients that had a history of other neurologic disorders, and those who had a history of eye problems causing vision loss. So, of course, dry eye does affect visual quality of life, but if we excluded any patient with dry eye in Utah, we would have zero patients in the study. So we just excluded patients who were actually under a physician's care for it. So this is just a table of the results. Um, 
in terms of the demographics of the groups. So there were 29 participants in the chronic migraine group, 37 in the episodic, and 32 in the controls. Uh, there were more women than men in the migraine group. And the, I have the average age listed of the patients there. So this slide I know is a little bit busy. Uh, the table at the top shows what the average of the composite scores were for the NEIVFQ25 and the 10 item supplement for each group. So in these questionnaires, greater scores indicate a better quality of life. So what you can see from the table is that the controls had the highest scores than episodics, than chronics. And these two tables here are just showing what the results of the unpaired t-tests were. Um, so there was a significant difference in terms of the scores of the chronic migraine compared to controls, the chronic migraine compared to episodics, and the episodics compared to the controls. So the chronic migraineurs had significantly worse scores than episodics who were worse than controls. And this was true for both questionnaires. And this is showing what the scores of the HIT-6 questionnaire were. And in this questionnaire, a greater score, a higher score, means that they had greater impact um, of the headaches on their life. So the, as you would expect, patients with chronic migraines had the greatest impact on their life. And again, this was statistically significant. Chronic migraineurs were the worst, worst, and then episodics, and then controls. And then these were the results of the migraine-specific quality of life. And it's broken down into three subscales. Uh, the role function restrictive are questions that assess how the migraines limit their social and work-related activities. The role function preventative questions assess how migraines prevent the activities and the emotional function questions assess the emotions associated with migraine. And again, these are not surprising results that the chronics were the worst and then episodics and then controls, but they're really important results. So, and these were all statistically significant. And one thing that we thought was very interesting, uh, the scores for the visual quality of life questionnaires in patients with chronic migraine were similar, they were not different than published values for patients who had other neuroophthalmic disorders like ischemic optic neuropathy and ocular myasthenia and thyroidia disease. So diseases that you would expect would really have a significant impact. Um, patients with chronic migraine were just as bad. Uh, so we're still in the process of analyzing the data and so we want to find out whether or not there's a correlation between decreased um, or a greater impact of headaches and their visual quality of life. We expect that there will be. Um, but the biggest conclusion that we are taking from it right now is that migraine has really significant effects on the visual quality of life. And if you see patients with migraines in an eye clinic, you know that that's true. But this is just kind of proving it to everybody. Um, and their quality of life has really decreased. So we understand a little bit about why that happens, but we really need to look further into what actually causes the decreased visual quality of life. And the other important issue is that when clinicians are assessing the overall disease burden of migraine, they really need to include what their visual quality of life is in that. So that's it for that part. These are the references. Does anyone have, yep. Which uh, items on the, the EFQ 25 were they lower on? Was it across the board or were there specific ones that? That's a really good question. It was across the board. I think the, the worst, the most decreased scores were actually with driving and near activities, I think were the most significantly decreased, but they actually were all the way across the board. But that's a really good question. So uh, last week, the trick that I learned from Eileen is that if you want people to pay attention to your presentation, you should show them a picture of your brother. So <laughs> I thought, oh, I could probably find a nice one from my wedding this past year. Um, but what I found out is that I cannot. And there are actually only three pictures of him from the entire wedding. And he also might be a little bit insane. <laughs> 
So I thought I would show it. So this is my brother, Caleb. <laughs> and this is the second picture that I found. That's Caleb eating dinner. And the third <laughs> is right there. That's literally the only picture from the wedding. OK, so let me switch over. All right, so this is about a patient that we saw in the clinic. He was a 53-year-old man that presented with double vision. He'd been seen by an outside ophthalmologist and referred in. He'd had three months of constant double vision that started fairly abruptly. He was on a long drive through Wyoming at night. And he had noticed since the time of onset that it was constant vertical binocular diplopia. He reported that it was progressively worse as the day went on and a little bit better after a nap. So when the double vision would get really bad, he would go rest his eyes for a little bit uh, or go take a nap for a little bit. And he would notice that his left lid appeared to be drooping when he got really tired. He wasn't having any trouble swallowing or breathing. So he really had no past medical history to speak of, but he also didn't follow regularly with a primary care physician. His neighbor is an Instacare doctor, so if he would have problems, he would just kind of like pop over there and he would help him out. So he didn't really find the need to go see anybody. But. He also had no past ocular history. And he'd already had an MRI of the brain in orbits, uh, which was read as normal other than some sinusitis. And so he went to his neighbor's house and they talked about it and they decided to do a course of antibiotics and prednisone to see if it would help. Uh, it did not, and he had just finished the course at the time uh, of his visit in the clinic. So on examination, his acuity was normal with some correction. His pupils were normal, his fields were normal, his color vision was normal, his pressure was normal. He had some asymmetry in terms of the positioning of his lids. His MRD1 was five on the right and four on the left. And other than that, his slit lamp exam and his dilated fundus exam were very unremarkable. And this was his motility and alignment exam. So what I'll point out is that he had a left hyper that seemed to be worse in right gaze and worse in left head tilt. Uh, he also appeared to have some upshoot in adduction of the left eye and wasn't quite able to get the right eye elevated fully, but so I will just throw that out to the group if anyone wants to throw out the answer. What typically will give you a left hyper that's worse in right gaze and worse in left head tilt? Yes, good job. Yeah, a left four. Okay, so I'll let you think just for a second about what would be in the differential for that, and I came up with some ideas myself. So probably most commonly top of the list would be <coughs> congenital or traumatic fourth nerve palsy. Uh, you could get a microvascular fourth nerve palsy, although that's not very common. If you had a little schwannoma on the fourth nerve or another tumor pushing on it, he could get it. Uh, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the fourth nerve at all. Maybe it's myasthenia or thyroid eye disease. Uh, you could get a vertical deviation with a skew, although you probably expect that to be a little bit more competent or maybe demyelination or aneurysm. So we actually think that there should be another thing on the list that you might not initially think of. And I didn't want to give this away before, but I'm going to show you his, a photograph of him. So what's probably most obvious or is jumping out to everybody is the asymmetry here. So he really has hollowing of the superior sulcus. And uh, it's a little bit hard to tell in the picture, but uh, this is actually much more full on the left eye than here. He also has some pseudo-retraction, and I'm sorry, the hooding of, with the dermatocolasis really doesn't let you see it, but uh, the lid margin is just a bit higher up uh, relative to its position to the limbus. 
And then I don't know how easy it is to appreciate, but he had about two to three millimeters of hypoglobus and two millimeters of enophthalmos. So at this point, uh, this, we thought this was very suspicious for silent sinus syndrome. So we really wanted to get a look at his images. So this is a coronal T1 fat sat image, which confirmed our suspicion. He's got an opacified and collapsed maxillary sinus here. And you can see that the orbital floor is depressed here. So his inferior rectus is just kind of hanging out there. And this is a slice from his CT that uh, was ordered by the ENT after he saw us. And I'll point out a couple of other things on that later. But I thought it just kind of nicely showed the difference in the contour of the floor. So at this point, we were asking ourselves, whether or not he had more than one problem causing the double vision. Uh, and you know, we thought, is all of this related to the silent sinus? Is any of it related to the silent sinus? Like, could he have a congenital fourth that he no longer can control because of the hypoglobus and enophthalmos? Um, but if you look back at the image here, you can compare the size of the superior obliques and if he had a congenital or long standing fourth, you would really expect the left to be smaller, but we thought it looked very symmetric. And in addition, his vertical fusional amplitude, amplitude was five prism diopters. So what we took from that is that he needed four to correct his deviation, and then he could fuse one additional prism diopter after that. So we thought that his <coughs> vertical fusional amplitudes were not increased, and essentially we did not think he had a congenital fourth going on. And we looked at the rest of his scan and didn't see anything like, you know, a tumor or other demyelinating lesions or something to suggest that he had something else going on. Uh, but we really couldn't say that he didn't also have something like myasthenia or thyroid eye disease. So we, act we did decide to test for that. And actually, at this point, Dr. Degree, she, yeah, she made me bet like place a monetary wager on whether or not I thought he also had myasthenia. Um, it's just like a little bit of a shark also. Uh, but she's got a plan for retirement. Yeah. She made a lot of money from that. It was a nickel. It was, it was <laughs> legal tender is what that is. But, uh, so the testing was negative. So at this point, we were pretty confident that all of his vertical, what's that? Which way did you bet? Uh, it's irrelevant. Way did you bet? It's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I lost. I lost. Uh, but so we were pretty confident that it was all related to the silent sinus syndrome. So it is a progressive enophthalmos and hypoglobus due to collapse of the orbital floor uh, in the presence of asymptomatic chronic maxillary sinusitis. So it was first described in 1964 by William Montgomery, who was an otolaryngologist. He described two cases of double vision and enophthalmos with maxillary sinus opacification and collapse. And after that, there were several more case reports, but the term silent sinus syndrome uh, was coined by Charles So Parker and his group in 1994. And they described 19 cases of hypoglobus and enophthalmos with asymptomatic maxillary sinus disease, so meaning they did not have symptoms of the chronic rhinosinusitis. And so it typically occurs in the fourth to fifth decade of life. Uh, the largest review of cases uh, had 84 patients. The average age was 39, and there were slightly more males as compared to females. So the underlying pathophysiology involves hypoventilation of the maxillary sinus due to obstruction of the osteomyeto complex. So the first thing that happens is that you obstruct the sinus os. And in 62% of patients, they have a lateralized middle turbinate, which we'll come back to. Uh, it can also be triggered by a deviated septum, a mucosal, a polyp, or even just chronic secretions. And interestingly, the underlying pathophysiology of silent sinus syndrome is considered to be very analogous to the pathophysiology behind uh, chronic eustachian tube dysfunction and the resultant tympanic membrane atelectasis. So this is just a little diagram 
describing what happens uh, in the course of silent sinus syndrome. So, as I said, the first thing that you get is occlusion of the sinus, which eventually leads to development of a negative pressure. And it's not really entirely understood why some people who block off the os develop negative pressure and some people don't, but uh, it's thought to lead to development of negative pressure because the uh, gas that's within the hypoventilated sinus gets resorbed by the capillaries uh, of the closed sinus. And so then you get this negative pressure. So Eric Kass and his group proved that there was a negative pressure. They took an 18-gauge needle with a uh, transducer attached, stuck it in there, and uh, showed that they had subatmospheric pressures on the affected <coughs> side. So they, then they get an accumulation of secretions uh, within the sinus. Uh, so what happens is the aqueous component of the secretions gets resorbed back in, and you're left with this transcellular exudate in a really thick mucus. And that leads to chronic subclinical inflammation, which kind of like continues this loop, and eventually you get maxillary sinus atelectasis. So all patients will have enophthalmos, usually two to six millimeters. About half patients will get hypoglobus, usually one to six millimeters. Most have double vision. The most common late abnormality is pseudo-retraction, but you can also get pseudotosis. And radiographs are an essential part of the diagnosis. You must have maxillary sinus shrinkage and opacification. You'll get a depressed orbital floor. And then you may see areas of bone demineralization of the orbital floor. It's a little bit controversial because it's not always seen. And in fact, there were some case reports where the maxillary walls actually were thickened after. Uh, but a lot of people think that the demineralization as a result of the chronic inflammation predisposes you to collapsing the floor. So this was an interesting case series where they described the radiographic findings. And there were only five patients, but they all had an enlarged middle meatus and all had varying degrees of uh, lateralization of the middle turbinate. So this is the CT scan from our patient. So I thought I would point out you can see how lateralized his middle turbinate is. And you know, this is sort of all now, all of this anatomy is like a big thickened mess. And you can use CT or MRI to diagnose it, but uh, a CT scan outlines the anatomy a little bit better and can, from what I read, help you differentiate other possible causes better. So this is a list of some, most, but not even all of the items that would be in a differential diagnosis for uh, silent sinus syndrome. Um, so I'll point out a couple of things that are really important to consider, like a malignancy can cause chronic obstruction of the os, so you'd want to rule that out when they have a procedure, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, sometimes it's just congenital asymmetry. Uh, sometimes it's orbital fat atrophy or bone growth arrest if they've had external beam radiation. So this was a really important retrospective observational case series. Uh, and this group included 19 patients that had been sent to them with the diagnosis of silent sinus syndrome, but they didn't actually have silent sinus syndrome. Um, they did have spontaneous asymptomatic enophthalmos, like asymptomatic meaning other than the double vision and that. But So this is a list of what it actually turned out to be. So in the majority of patients, they'd had unrecognized orbital floor fractures. Uh, a, a large amount actually had Peri-Romberg syndrome or linear scleroderma, they're on the spectrum. It's um, hemifacial atrophy. And three of them, it was congenital facial asymmetry. Two of them actually had thyroid eye disease. Uh, one of them had HIV-related lipodystrophy, and one had an asymmetric facial atrophy from Barraker simmons which is an, a rare acquired uh, lipodystrophy syndrome. And one had metastatic breast cancer in the orbit. So just some important things to think about that you know, it's, may not be as obvious as it seems. So there are two main goals of treatment. The first is to relieve the obstruction and improve maxillary sinus drainage. And the second is to restore normal orbital anatomy. So the first goal is accomplished through a sinus procedure. Uh, the Caldwell loop, 
uh, involves fenestration of the anterior maxillary wall, so they actually go in like up under the lip. But that's an older procedure and has fallen out of favor, um, and people primarily use FES now. So the uh, two aims are to reestablish normal drainage of the maxillary sinus and then to aspirate and culture secretions, and you can also uh, you know, do a biopsy if you're concerned about malignancy. Functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So this involves uh, using an endoscope to go up through the nose. So they may or may not start with a septoplasty to improve access. Then they remove the uncinent process so that they can uh, have access to the osteomedial complex. And then they do an antrostomy to enlarge the ass. So the need for and timing of reconstruction of the orbital floor is in some ways, some people think it's a little controversial. Uh, in this series of patients, 22 out of 23 of them had resolution of their symptoms after just FES alone, but not everybody resolved with FES alone. So there are a couple of different timing uh, options. You can do a single stage procedure with the FES, or you can do it two to six months after the FES, uh, or not at all. Uh, the implant choices, implants that have been used successfully are, you know, varied. So you can do titanium plates, you can do implants, you can do septal or costochondral cartilage. Uh, another interesting option is using hyaluronic acid gel. So this is a group out of Greece and they injected like two cc's into the intraconal and extraconal spaces and had good, they had improvement of uh, the patient's enophthalmos for about six months but this wouldn't be expected to really do anything for hypoglobus, but it's an option. And I thought very interestingly, you could also do an inferior oblique myectomy on the contralateral side. So David Guyton wrote this up in 2010, a patient who's a 41-year-old man who presented with double vision, and he was found to have silent sinus syndrome on the right and causing an apparent left superior oblique palsy. So they felt that the depression of the orbital floor resulted in tightening of the ipsilateral inferior rectus and inferior oblique, and then loosening of the ipsilateral superior rectus and superior oblique, and then that mimicked uh, fourth nerve. But they actually also had the apparent inferior oblique overaction on the left side, just like our patient had. And so he, this, the guy in the case had already undergone FES and didn't have complete resolution of his double vision. So he was going to have reconstruction of the orbital floor, but then somebody sent them to this clinic, so they thought, let's try an inferior oblique myectomy, and it worked. So I thought that was very interesting. That's it. Any questions? It did. It did. It that just was missed. Yeah, that was that. The MRI that I showed was from the outside hospital. We just got it sent in. Right. This wasn't noticed. You know, it's hard to know everything, and so you really depend on your fellow physicians with expertise, like in radiology and your nose and throat, to help you out when you're in a bind. And so you really feel screwed when you send somebody for an MRI and they don't read it. <laughs> And so sometimes you just have to do it yourself. And a lot of, you know, in fairness, a lot of radiologists have never heard of silent sinus. And I've heard of very few ENTs have it either. Yes. How long does it take for resolution if they are adequately aerating that sinus? And how long does it take for the oral anatomy to really normalize enough to make the double vision better? It's a really good question. I have no idea what the average amount of time is, but I know that typically people will give it up to six months. Mm -hmm. Dr. Patel, do you have any more experience with that? Does that mean that the so it's a combination of pseudo-infection and pseudo-tosis. Both, you know, the 
So that thing is a little controversial because you, you would have to reverse a lot the aeration, the ability for the buildings that still inside us to go back to normal and natural. So the floor doesn't rise. The floor will always remain. So we need to wait about six months and then we do it again with that. Sometimes you have to get the later the cooler and the puddles and so on. So that, that's the one controversial thing we have to do. They only looked at symptoms, people looked at signs, people observed both symptoms and signs. So I think the question of all is if you look at our job, you make a big openness with the auxiliary signs and the standard. And our patient did have the fest, and he felt like his double vision was a little better, but it's not resolved. So he's actually going to see you in like he's here. <laughs> So in the 2000s, my Greek fellow and I we did a study on this and published that the pressure is both during surgery, which shows the difference in pressure, and the second day during surgery, six months later, it actually shows that the pressure remains normalized. Once you, once you touch the whole thing, it's normalized. It's normal for a few weeks. So again, in this part of the world, all the noise. So that brings to mind what to do to fix it. And you know, I, I, I have a lot of respect for being guidance, but if you recess the contralateral inferior oblique, you're probably going to give it some solution. So the thing to do is if we're going to have to fix this, if it doesn't get better, which it may well do gradually, you want to check for reductions in the operating room. If that ipsilateral inferior rectus is tight, I mean, Keeping in mind, you've got left eye higher than right. Your options are either bring left eye down, is what you're going to accomplish with the inferior oblique recession, or bring right eye up, which is what you, you would do if you're inferior oblique. On the left, if you recess the right inferior rectus, you'll bring the eye up. You'll help normalize the position of the eye. And if that's tight, it'll turn out to have been the right thing to do. Probably a decision you can't really make in the operating, but that issue of torsion is kind of key because if you do an inferior oblique recession, in a patient that does not have torsion, they're going to come back saying, yeah, things are kind of okay, but now this image is twisted like this, doc, and then you're kind of playing catch up trying to fix that, uh, doing offsets on additional muscles you're operating on, which won't be the best thing. So the smart thing would be for the patient to get better. <laughs> <laughs> and I vote for that. So, Viking's case was, the patient has no uh, um, surgery, not the, the muscle surgery. Right. He had a FES. He had a FES. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think your steps should be do a FES, get the order to the natural vector order before you do muscle surgery. Yeah. It's just like with thyroid disease. You know, so Absolutely. It's, uh, it's the old syndrome of if you go to a rectal surgeon with a bit of trouble with they'll fix you rectally. It's the business of the doctor. It's a, it's a more common approach. <laughs> and it, it didn't come up in, in any of your, uh, in any of the articles you cited, but I've got a patient I've been following for about 10 years now who just doesn't want to take the time out of his busy schedule to do strabismus surgery. So we've been managing him with prisms, and he's been perfectly happy with that. Well, that, that works too. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Good sense. This guy's deviation is probably a little too common. Just don't look right. <laughs> and, and he's slightly better already. Didn't you talk with yeah. him? And yeah, he's already better. Not, not entirely better, but. but quite a bit better. And that's just, he's only post-op, what, six weeks or something like that. Yeah. And the swelling goes down. Yeah. 
Thanks. 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 Thanks.